Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by the ACI Ontario and the ICRI Toronto chapter. I am one of your moderators, Chris Christidis. The other moderator is Stacia Van Zieten. And today we're gonna start our uh, webinar with uh, the Sidra Smart Hatch technology overview. Our presenter is Doug Luce. Uh, he is a, his position is the technology and application development. I'll give you a little bit of a bio of, of Doug before we get started, and then we'll go straight into his uh, presentation for today. Uh, Doug Luce has been employed at Sidra Concrete Services since 1999, uh, performing various roles in technology and application development. Doug focuses on development and commercialization new products and applications in the industrial markets that Sidra serves. He was heavily involved in early stage development and field testing of Sidra's acoustic technology platform for measuring air entrained air in slurries and viscous materials. He is currently focused on real-time measurements of concrete quality that include using the physics of acoustics to measure the air content of wet concrete in ready mix operations. Prior to his work at Sidra, Doug held engineering positions at Siemens, Westinghouse, and United uh, Technologies. He has a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT, and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Penn State. So, Doug, if you would like to start the presentation. Great. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Uh, All good on the presentation, Chris? Actually, before you start there, Doug, I should yeah. say that everybody's mic is obviously muted, as I'm sure you've all attended these meetings before. Uh, if you have any questions, there is a question box that you can ask those questions. And at the end of each uh, presenter's present, uh, presentation, we can address these questions and ask the presenter. So sorry, Doug, go ahead. No, no problem. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Um, as Chris mentioned, uh, I work with Sidra Concrete Systems. We're based in uh, Wallingford, uh, Connecticut. That's where I'm speaking to you uh, from today, from our offices. And I'm just going to give you a quick uh, overview of our uh, Smart Hatch technology. Um, before I get started on the technology, just a little bit of background. Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, Sidra. Uh, concrete Systems and the company, the company Sidra, has been around since 1996, um, and we have uh, developed process optimization uh, solutions uh, for many industries uh, around the globe: uh, the mining industry, pulp and paper, um, consumer products, uh, oil and gas, uh, many different industries. Uh, we entered the uh, uh, concrete um, industry probably about 10 years ago. Um, we had some acoustic technology for measuring um, the air content of liquids and slurries and uh, knowing that, that uh, air is an important ingredient of uh, concrete, we looked at uh, that uh, as, as an industry we could possibly uh, use our technology uh, in, and uh, that's what really got us into the concrete industry, like I said, about 10 years ago. Um, more recently, we've been focusing on the ready mix market, and that's what I'm here to, to talk to you today about our smart hatch technology. Um, and uh, we've been uh, we've partnered uh, with Sika in this venture, and uh, so that's what the, just so I just wanted to to um, uh, make everyone aware that uh, that uh, Sika is our partner in this. And um, there's, uh, we are working with them to, uh, to, to commercialize this technology. Uh, so just an overview of the um, Smart Hatch uh, measurement suite. Uh, I'm really gonna focus a little bit more on the air content today, but just, just gives you an overview of the, of the uh, Smart Hatch uh, technology. Um, and what it can measure uh, on your trucks, on your ready mix trucks. Uh, primarily is the air content and concrete temperature. 
That's through a sensor that gets uh, mounted on the uh, drum itself, a drum mounted sensor. Um, in addition to that, there's optional sensors that can be added, such as the hydraulic pressure for the uh, drum motor, uh, water add flow meter. Those are both optional sensors that can be added to the system. Um, other things that, uh, because we have sensors on the truck and on the drum, other things that we are able to measure and report, uh, the returning volume of concrete, uh, revolution counters, uh, timers, the status of the drum, um, the speed of the drum, the rotation speed and direction, and then also, um, because data is is archived in a cloud database, there is access to that data um, through the through an API. So uh, I'll just focus a little bit now on the um, on the air measurement. And uh, as Chris mentioned, this is a, a something that uses acoustics. Um, air bubbles uh, have a have a huge impact on the acoustic properties of uh, any liquid and slurry. And really, this was first uh, a lot of this uh, the research in bubbles and in, in liquids and slurries was done really back in the 50s and 60s during the Cold War, when submarine um, submarines were really uh, you know coming online and being developed for uh, you know for as part of the the, the Cold War, and uh, you know sonar was was a big part of that, and. Uh, what they found were these uh, bubbles of, you know, clouds of air bubbles that uh, are, are in in the in the waters, more so near shorelines, but in the waters of the ocean would impact the um, the sonar properties of the submarines. And so some research was done, and 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 uh, you know there was you know the, the it was found how the how how significant the impact of the acoustic properties on seawater. Or these these bubble uh, bubbles have. Um, it was really even there was even even before that there was a lot of um, just anecdotal um, I guess knowledge of how bubbles impact the acoustic properties uh, even as far back as the 1800s when uh, you know there'd be like a frothy uh, drink and they could tell that there was a different sound to the if you tap the glass of a of a frothy drink versus uh, just like a glass of water that maybe didn't have any air bubbles in it. And um, I sometimes do a, um, a little demonstration. You can try, try this at home if you like, but you take a glass of water in a glass and tap it. It has a nice ring to it. It'll, it'll ring and almost like a bell. Um, if you drop, a, say, like an Alka-Seltzer tablet or some kind of effervescent tablet in there and generate some bubbles and then tap it, it'll be a very dead sound, very dramatic change in the way that the you know tapping on that glass uh, sounds and that's that is due to the uh, significant effect of air bubbles on the acoustic properties of the water and the glass um, so by using this technology the smart hatch uh, measures the uh, the smart hatch measures changes in acoustic properties of the concrete more specifically the cement paste and from that we determine the uh, the percentage of, of air bubbles in that in the paste. Um, it's really the first and only. It's, a, it's something that we did patent here at Sidra, um, where we can make this measurement in the drum of the truck, um, all the way from the batch plant to the job site. Uh, the picture on the lower right hand shows the uh, the sensor itself. This is the the inside of the sensor. So this is the the piece that would would be in contact with the concrete. And you can see some of the acoustic elements there, the red, uh, the red urethane uh, piece, and then a smaller round uh, uh, sensor uh, receiver. Those are, those are the, some of the acoustic elements that are in contact with the concrete that generates the acoustic noise and then makes measurements of the properties of the concrete to determine the air content. Uh, this is just an example. Um, these numbers aren't accurate necessarily, but just somewhat of an example of of how uh, dramatic uh, bubbles affect the acoustic properties uh, for wet concrete. Uh, this is just a graph that shows the acoustic speed or how fast sound waves travel through the cement paste versus the uh, air content. So you can see, and just for reference, um, 
So the, the acoustic speed on the left is shown in meters per second. And just for reference, pure water would have an acoustic speed of approximately 1,400 meters per second. So just with 1% by volume air, the acoustic speed is reduced to only 70 meters per second. So a huge reduction with just a small amount of air. And um, it continues even out to, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of, a lot of times your target range, 6% air, um, the acoustic speed is under 25 meters per second in this example. So it's just a dramatic change in those acoustic properties. And that's what the smart hatch takes advantage of uh, in order to measure the air content. Uh, so this is just what you would see. Uh, hopefully it shows up okay, but uh, this is uh, just a screenshot I took from our, our portal for one of our customers. Um, and this just shows a, a really a 90 minute uh, history of, of, a, of a load. And the blue, light blue um, uh, graph shows the RPM of the drum, the, the speed of the drum in R, the RPM. And so you can see at the left, they, they were mixing, they, they charged the drum and then did the mixing. And then once the RPM slows to under about six, uh, seven RPM, you see the darker blue curve. And it's a little hard to tell on my screen. I think that's like a green, green curve. Um, that shows the air and the temperature. So this is, uh, like I said, uh, uh, after they, they mix, the air and the temperature begin to report once the drum slows. And that is reported all the way to the job site. Uh, every turn of the drum is going to give an update on both the air and the temperature measurements. This is just an example of a, what a higher measurement this in this case it's showing 9.1%. So that's a relatively high air uh, for a load of concrete, but that's what it's reporting. And um, you know, so it's uh, able to measure air uh, easily 9%, uh, really even into the you know 10 to 15 percent range. Uh, can, can measure the air content. Uh, this is a no air measurement. So this this is an example of a, a concrete mix that uh, did not have any air in it. Um, but there's always some air. There's always a little bit of entrapped air. And so in this case, it's reading 2.3%. So it's a, a no air mix that still has some air in it. And, and the smart hatch uh, technology is still able to, to measure that. Um, so we did some testing uh, of the, of the uh, Smart Hatch technology. Uh, this was done uh, about two years ago uh, with um, a company here in Connecticut that we, uh, we've uh, been working with, Tilcon, um, and we uh, partnered with Dr. Ken Hover from Cornell University. He kind of helped us design this test and, and he was uh, participating in, in the testing with us. Um, and what it was, we took an eight yard kind of typical uh, air and trained structural mix that Tilcon uses. Um, and we had a, uh, one of their mixers had the smart hatch uh, system installed. We had uh, three different test teams, all ASTM certified testers. Then each team had two of the um, ASTM pressure pots. Um, and then what we did, we wanted to, we wanted to simulate uh, you know, what the concrete does when it's from the batch plant to the job site. So we uh, had four different sample points right after it was batched. And then we started to uh, empty the drum to take samples. And over time, that took maybe an hour and a half uh, till the drum was nearly empty as we took four different sample points. And you can see in the picture that we filled up three different wheelbarrows of samples and then ran all the uh, typical tests that were run, density, pressure, uh, the air through pressure. Uh, we took, made cylinders to uh, get a hardened air and then also took the slump and the temperature. And there's actually, I'll show you a graph on the next slide, but there's a technical paper um, that uh, Dr. Hover authored and that's available on the CIDRA website if you, if you wanna read more about this testing. Um, but this graph shows uh, what the testing looked like. Uh, and the results of the testing on the bottom, the orange shows the, uh, the drum speed. So that shows the RPM of the drum. So you can see right in the far left, 
Uh, we put eight yards uh, of concrete into the truck and that was mixed. And you can see the air content in blue started out about 6.8% and uh, quickly dropped to about 5.7%. Uh, and that's pretty typical. We see usually a fairly, uh, you know, some a, a drop in the air from right after it's batched. And that's a, some of that entrapped air works its way out. We took the first sample point at about 745. And the, um, the red dots are all the air pot measurements that were taken, again, by the three different teams, two air pots per team. And then they also took gravimetric measurements, which are the green. Uh, the light blue dots are the, uh, we took two at each test point, uh, is the hardened air measurements. Those were from the cylinders, and those were done, taking the samples, made the cylinders, and then uh, we got those results after a few weeks uh, when we sent those away for the testing. And you can see the four different points, and you can see the dark blue is, is what the air track read in between the sample points. And really the, the, the point of, of this test, I think what we, we've, we've concluded from this test is that, you know, especially I get asked, you know, usually when I give this presentation, the first question that comes up is how accurate is the smart hatch? How accurate is the air measurement of the smart hatch? And I, I tend to, um, give a long-winded answer to that and and i'm not trying to, to avoid the question um, but you can see from this that you know what is the air content of the concrete you know to, to, to answer the accuracy question you need to know what is the actual the real air content of the concrete and these are all the methods the air pot and the gravimetric and maybe hardened air that's that's what we have to compare to and uh, you can see from this taking from the same truck taking you know three testers, uh, certified testers, uh, air pots that were calibrated. You can see the, the, the wide variation of air measurements that were taken at each point. And you can see that the uh, smart hatch output is basically in the same family of each of these uh, test points where the results from the test points. But if you only took one point, one air pot measurement at each of these points, um, you know, is that really the, the actual air content of the entire load of concrete? And that's where, that's what I think this really highlighted to us is, you know, it's, it's tough to get from one sample of concrete, one small sample out of a, out of a you know, a nine meter load or however big your, your, your load is, you take one small sample and fill an air pot, uh, you get an air measurement, you get one point. Um, but really, is that truly representative of the entire a load of concrete and uh, versus the the smart hatch is you know really giving you a, a picture of the air how it's changing over time and it's really giving you a, a continuous updating every time the drum rotates um, there's a there's a continuous update of um, of the air measurement so uh, I think I'm running pretty close to my 20 minutes I had a few more slides just on some of the other uh, features of the uh, smart hatch, and I'll just skip through those real quick, and then we can uh, I can finish up here. Um, one of the other things, the acoustic, um, the acoustic properties of the concrete, uh, because now we have an acoustic sensor on the drum. Um, another thing we can do is determine the interface between the the uh, empty space above the concrete in the drum, and then the concrete that's sitting in the bottom of the drum, and that gives us the ability to measure the the volume. Uh, of the concrete, generally less than about four and a half meters of concrete and less. So it's really the returning volume that's coming back from the job site. And uh, we can measure that through the acoustic properties as well. And I'll just skip through uh, these last few slides here and uh, then take any questions. Uh, this just, just to give you an overview of the components of the Smart Hatch, we've really focused today on the real-time measurement uh, the, the sensor that goes actually on the drum itself, um, and that's where we get the air, the acoustic uh, properties. So we get the air percentage. We also get the temperature. I mentioned the volume in the drum, and then also the drum rotation. There are other components of the system that that are installed on the truck. Um, optionally, a hydraulic pressure sensor, a, a water add meter, but then there are other pieces of the system, such as the receiver module and in cab display. And then uh, the portal allows remote access of all the data and it's all archived in the cloud. 
So that's just an overview of the, all the components of the smart hatch system. Uh, I mentioned the water flow meter. Again, most of you, are, you know, you're familiar with that. You know what that is. Um, and it, in the, the, with the smart hatch system, it is integrated into the entire system. Um, I'm just going to skip through these because I think I'm pretty close to the 20 minutes. So uh, again, hydraulic pressure, same thing. Um, it's just an add-on. A lot of trucks may already have that, but it is a, another uh, add-on that can be added to where it's all integrated. So all that information, all that data is in one database. It's stored in the cloud, and it uh, can be uh, looked at real time as a truck is driving to the job site, or it can be archived anytime in the future. Uh, just some of the benefits, which we've heard from customers. Um, you, know, you probably have your own ideas and be interested to hear uh, any ideas you have as far as you know the benefits of a system like this. You know what, knowing the air as a truck is driving to the job site, how that can help your your operation. I would be uh, really interested to hear um, your feedback on that. And that's really it. That's what I had. There's a, a website there if you want more information. Cinderconcrete.com. Um, and we are we do have some systems operating uh, in Canada. And uh, certainly happy uh, to, uh, to answer any questions at this point. I, I guess, Chris, I'm not sure how you, if we were going to just move on to the next presentation or answer questions now, what, how are you want to? We're going to answer the here? questions. We have uh, three, two, real two questions here for you, Doug. Okay. Um, so the first question is, uh, does the normal cleaning prevent pace buildup on the acoustic sensor? Uh, or does the sensor have to be taken out for the cleaning? And then the, to add to that, uh, how many problems have you found with concrete buildup on the sensor? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the sensor is designed for the environment of the, of the mixer uh, itself. So it, can, it uh, doesn't have to be removed for any kind of cleaning other than, um, you know, we, we, you know we, we need to tell you it should be removed for if you're going to do chipping, that type of cleaning. Um, yeah, I know a lot of times the hatches don't get removed, but you know our official uh, stance on that is it, it should be removed for tripping, uh, chipping. Um, you know, having said that, it doesn't always get done, but uh, you know we don't we wouldn't want um, the the uh, any chipping to be done right on the sensor itself. So, um, but as far as just normal um, cleaning of the of the drum at the end of the day or in between loads, um, it, you know it's it's uh, you know normal cleaning is is fine. Um, and the drums should be kept clean. I mean, not just for the the sensor, uh, you have the smart hatch sensor, but obviously just to keep the, the every you know the drum clean and, the, and not get built up in the drum itself. Um, obviously, should be cleaned uh, routinely. Um, the only I must just go back a few pages and show you. I can explain a little better uh, that picture of the sensor. So if you see this picture of the sensor, um, typically what we see is where the sensor, you know, where the sensor is mounted on the hatch there, those 90 degree, you know, angles um, in the fillets, uh, we would see some uh, build up, a little bit of build up there occasionally. Um, typically the top surface of the sensor itself where the acoustic elements are located, we very rarely, if ever, see any buildup there. Uh, that sticks into the concrete um, about a about 100 millimeters or so, about four inches into the um, into the drum. So that surface stays relatively clean, and that's really what's important. So as long as is this top surface stays clean, there won't be any change in the performance. The performance will be fine, and, and it'll work fine. That's typically what we see. Um, you may see some buildup along the uh, corners uh, where it's where it's connected, you know, uh, bolted to the um, to the hatch, and that even if you get some buildup there, that's not a problem. Uh, it won't affect the performance of the sensor. Okay, Doug. The second question here is: um, Does normal drum cleaning? Prov oh no, excuse me, that was already asked. Uh... This thing has shifted on me, so it threw me off. Can smart hatch be used to measure air content in concrete that has already hardened slash cured? No, no, it's only it only measures um, 
you know, plastic concrete uh, in the range of 50 millimeters slump and greater. So um, it won't uh, it won't really measure like curb mixes, real dry mixes below about 50 millimeters of slump. Uh, it's just too dry at that point. Um, so it does have to have uh, somewhat of a, of a, a you know a liquid paste um, for the acoustics to really um, you know, for the physics of the acoustics to really work. So uh, you know the, the self consolidating concrete is fine, um, and anything you know about 50 millimeter slump and greater, anything I would say on the on order of 0.3 water to cement ratio and greater. Um, but yeah, it has to be, uh, be prior to curing, you know, while it's in the truck before it's cured. Okay, there's some more questions coming in. Um, the next one is, how much of an impact does slump play? I think you just kind of went over that, but maybe you can just say it again here. For example, going through a slow slump concrete to a SEC, for example. So something with a very low slump versus a, a, an SEC. Right. Yeah, um, we don't see, again, as long as the slump is greater than about 50 millimeters, um, there's not a, 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 a big impact that we've seen to the calibration of the system. There really is no calibration. It's pretty much a um, first principles uh, measurement. So um, one, one, you know, the, the physics of the acoustics um, is such that the, once you get a small amount of air bubbles, in, in any liquid or slurry, um, the bubble itself really dominates the acoustics. So even going, I mean, we're using same similar calibrations for, um, you know, liquid uh, detergent. You know, some of our other customers use, you know, this for like measuring, uh, you know, an air entrainment in uh, in very viscous like liquid detergents or pulp slurries. Um, we're really using the same algorithms and same calibrations for those as we are for the concrete and really what happens is the the whether it's uh, water or cement paste um, the properties of the liquid part of the mixture um, really lose importance once you have a small amount of air in there the air bubbles really dominate the acoustic properties of that and the properties of the um, the liquid like or, or the slurry part of the mixture become less and less important. So yeah, going from like a like a 50 millimeter slump to an SCC, um, we really don't have to change the calibration uh, for that at all. It's uh, it, it's you can you know you can use the same same uh, calibrations all through that range. All right, Doug. One more question, just if you can just go through quickly here, because yeah, sure. we want to go on to the next presenter here. Absolutely. Is the technology recognized by ASTM or ACI uh, for air content measurement in concrete? Yeah, the quick answer to that is it's not, um, not at this time. It's something um, we are working with. Um, you know, here in the U.S., we're working with um, uh, AASHTO, the uh, DO, you know, state DOTs, transportation departments. Um, so we're working with them um, and to to recognize it. Uh, some of our local authorities um, have started to, uh, you know, recognize it somewhat informally but it's something over time that we do want to uh, formalize um, but at this time there's no formal recognition by um, any of the uh, of the industries it's just too new to be recognized at this point by um, the certifying agencies but it is, it is something that we're working towards perfect thank you Doug You're um, welcome. thank you everyone let's uh, let's move on to our next presentation for today uh, the presentation is helping extend the service life of the Gardner Expressway. Our presenter is Ryan uh, Rieger, and he is a district manager at HCM Shawcrete. Um, I'll give Ryan's uh, bio before we get started with his presentation here. So Ryan's construction background started in the concrete forming industry, um, which opened his eyes to construction engineering. He has a civil engineering undergrad degree and a master's degree focused on structural engineering. He has worked in the oil and gas sector and now works for HC Matcon Inc., who is a full service earth retention and foundations contractor that specializes in sustainable foundations, including shockcrete, shockcrete rehabilitation, and structural shockcrete. 
At HCM, his role is to provide direction and support to Shockrete business unit in the delivery of Shockrete specialty products, ensuring new construction, architectural features, and infrastructure rehabilitation. Uh, Ryan, if uh, you'd like to start your presentation here. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction. I just want to confirm there that uh, my presentation is showing up properly. Looks great. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank the ACI Ontario chapter for the opportunity to present on this project. Uh, as you can see here on the opening slide, uh, the Gardner Expressway has uh, had, had some issues over its service life and uh, is coming to its end and needs to be uh, taken care of and planned properly. Um, so these are snapshots of uh, the project we were on prior to rehabilitation. Uh, and this happened uh, in the summer of 2020. Uh, as Chris already introduced me, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this slide and the company I work for. Um, so a general outline of what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to Shawcrete. Um, hopefully most of the audience has heard about Shawcrete, uh, but I'll touch on some of uh, the important concepts. I'll give an e overview of the actual project, the scope of work that was completed, the mixes we used, uh, the equipment, how we uh, ensured that we were conforming to the specifications for the engineer record through quality assurance and as well as curing methods used on this project. So Shockrete 101, um, commonly misunderstood. Shockrete is not a product. It's actually a method of placing concrete um, as defined by ACI 506, the guide to Shockrete. Shockrete is a mortar or concrete that's pneumatically projected at high velocity onto the, the surface achieving compaction. Um, that's the most important thing to know about Shockrete is it's just a method of placement of concrete. Uh, in, in this project, we use the dry mix Shockrete process um, where the material is conveyed through a hose by compressed air. Water is added at the nozzle, uh, resulting in a plastic material upon impact. Um, this figure here shows uh, using a pre-dampener bagged dry mix material into a Shockrete gun which is then conveying the material via air compressor and the water supply is added at the nozzle prior to um, hitting the receiving face. Um, this is more of a traditional uh, setup for the dry mix process. On this project, we ended up using a hydro mix nozzle, um, which injects the water around 10 feet behind the actual nozzle, uh, eliminating the need for a pre-dampener um, which actually mixes the uh, dry mix material in the hose before it gets uh, conveyed to the receiving surface. Uh, due to the lighter weight equipment and hose compared to wet mix, dry mix has become very popular on uh, rehabilitation projects because logistics are a little bit easier because you can start and stop and pump longer distances uh, when you're doing uh, patchwork rehabilitation. As you can see, there's some advantages of using dry mix shawcrete. Um, you can use little to no formwork. You can have irregular shapes. Uh, there's a great bond to the substrate because of the high cement content. Uh, it's a speedy process when it is uh, small patches that you have to move around a lot. Uh, and there is obviously savings in schedule and cost for rehabilitation. So Project. Uh, this project was in Toronto, the Gardner Expressway, by exhibit the area. Uh, the infrastructure is owned by the City of Toronto. Our record was Doug Dixon and Associates. The general contractor was Clearwater Structures, who was in charge of uh, all of the access and concrete removal scope work. And HCM was the specialty shockrete contractor that placed around 70 cubic meters of dry mix shockrete. Uh, during rehabilitating this structure. So expressway scope of work was from the west abutment to vent 35. Um, the scope of work was sandwiched between the GO transit rail line and the TTC transit rail line. Uh, the intent was to minimize the effects to the exhibition place and its stakeholders and users. The space is used by Toronto Parks, Toronto Police, Metrolinx and TTC. 
uh, dust control was very, very ability of drivers or patrons health and safety in the area. It's a very active area with a lot of people. Uh, additionally, uh, it's an active green pea parking area and these repairs were required due to spalling on vehicles, potential pedestrians. Uh, during this uh, project, there were constraints um, due to the nature of this area. Previously scheduled were the Heart and Stroke Foundation Ride for the Heart, the Honda Indy, the Toronto Caribbean Carnival Festival, and the Canadian National Exhibition. The events like this, um, due to COVID-19 pandemic, these events were canceled last year. However, uh, the terms of our contract were still in effect, so we had to keep to strict uh, scheduling and sequencing constraints. Um, this is a plan view of the deck showing the sporadic spalling and patches work between vents constrained uh, to between four bays between vents at a time and within these bays a maximum timeline of two weeks was provided for removal and full rehabilitation of the soffit and the vents. <clears throat> so the overall rehabilitation uh, to sound the existing structure for delaminated concrete, saw cut to 25 millimeters, remove the delaminated concrete and all other foreign substances which may affect the adhesion of the material, uh, clear behind millimeters to ensure that there's a good bond to the existing substrate, increase surface reference via sandblasting and clean the corroded steel. Welded wire uh, mesh was then installed um, on the face of the reinforcing steel for uh, additional support and prior to shock replacement and finishing uh, was achieved um, and then curing via 24-hour moist cure, moist cure via fog misting wow. and a curing compound was applied for a general overview. So touching on the mix design, <clears throat> we approximately placed 70 cubic meters um, the mix had 8% silica fume with a water cement ratio of 0 0.4 and was air and trained at 4 to 8%. Uh, on the deck soffit, patches were repaired using uh, King Shockrete's product, which is now a Sika company, MSD1X, with a wood screed finish. Um, due to the live traffic above the deck, um, we worked with uh, King and their technical team to come up with a, a dosage of the accelerant to compact the vibration effects uh, of the live traffic to ensure that we had an adequate bond and we didn't have any fallout while placing shockrete. Then on the vents, the columns and beams were repaired with the same mix without the accelerant and we were able to use a steel prowl to finish um, on these components. Our equipment we used um, was an Oliva 246.5 dry mix rotary gun and a hydromix nozzle versus a pre-dampener, which is a traditional setup and a 700 CFM compressor. The hydromix nozzle was used at the water ring 10 feet from the nozzle to properly mix the shockrate material that's conveyed by the compressor. Due to height restrictions, we, we would typically use a silo that holds up to three cubic meters of dry material to reduce dust, um, but we weren't able to do that breaking 25 kilogram bags uh, over top of the dry mix rotary gun. Uh, we opted to build a frame to support bulk bags. Um, this both reduced the line of fire for our gun operator's hands since that is a rotary gun with a screen um, and also reduced the amount of dust that's going into the operation um, to ensure that we weren't uh, impeding in the neighboring uh, users of this area. For the quality assurance part of it, we ensure that we uh, continually get certified with our skilled nozzlemen through ACI and MTO certifications for both wet and dry mix shock replacement methods, both overhead and vertical orientations. This is a photo from our yard prior to this project where we were getting recertified via dry mix. Um, during the Gardner project, uh, mock-up panels were tested to, quantify, to qualify the uh, compressive strength of the material that was placed in each orientation and yielding results at seven days, 21 days, and 28 days to ensure that we conform to the specification for the engineer. Typically in Canada, we mostly worry about cold weather effects in the construction industry. Uh, however, 
due to the scheduling of this project in the middle of summer, we had to come back hot weather um, conditions. Uh, with the nature of shockrete, anything over 28 degrees, similar to, to concrete, uh, it's very important to reduce the actual internal temperature and ensure that we don't lose any of the internal mixed water due to evaporation when we're actually conveying the material to the receiving surface and help control the shock rehydration process. Uh, we did this through numerous ways. We used cold water <clears throat> as the mixing water at the nozzle, the hydromix mixing. We, as per the spec, surface saturated dye, dry the substrate for two hours prior to placing the, the shock rate. And in this photo, you can see uh, one of our crews um, fogging the area to reduce the ambient temperature as well. Uh, we both had a thermal couple measuring the ambient temperature as well as uh, temperature guns to point and shoot at the concrete substrate to ensure that we were conforming to the specification and ensuring that we weren't above the temperature limits. Uh, further to ensure that we did not lose the internal uh, mixed water due to evaporation. A wet cure was done for 24 hours via fog mixing and we hoarded the area that we were shooting to reduce wind and sun exposure to try uh, to mitigate any hot weather uh, issues. For the rehabilitation of the saw fit, uh, the is uh, calculated for the actual removal of the quantity of the spall in behind the bar. Removals were very slow and delicate as we did not want to cause additional damage to the existing structure. On the right, you can see some of the spalling from the uh, deck soffit of the Gardner Expressway. <clears throat> On the uh, left photo here, you can see a, a small skylight that occurred. Uh, during the removals process due to the active traffic above and heavy loads from transport trucks and trucks. Uh, we were very diligent um, on using proper equipment and hand tools to do the chipping behind the bar. Um, but uh, the light through the deck, we immediately deployed traffic control to close down the lane above and repair the slab via through slab replacement and asphalt. On the middle and right photos, you can see the repair area that's highlighted in orange. Um, on the top of the middle photo there, you can see the reinforcing steel has already been prepped, chipped, sandblasted, and the galvanized wire mesh has been replaced. So this patch has been deemed to be suitable for uh, rehabilitation. However, the patch right below that has not been uh, touched. The engineer of record was doing all the sounding and dictating which patches would be repaired. And the, the criteria to have a patch that was repaired was based on the delamination of the concrete behind the transverse deck reinforcement. The longitudinal reinforcement was embedded in sound concrete. The delaminated area was not going to be repaired on this contract. And on the right, you can see that uh, majority of the um, patches were enlarged in, in between all of the structural elements of the deck. So this is a couple of photos of our shock replacement occurring once the removals were signed off by the engineer of record and the substrate was pre-soaked to SSD conditions. Uh, HCM's nozzle been shot from scissor lifts, allowing the nozzle to be within one to one and a half meters of receiving surface to ensure proper compaction and encapsulation of the rebar. Uh, if you see the nozzle also shooting, he's shooting at a 90 degree uh, orientation to ensure the proper encapsulation of that rebar. Ventilation fans were also used the scissor lift uh, to, to remove dust and increase the visibility for the men placing in the area. Uh, obviously, PPE was worn to protect the crew from certain concrete burns, uh, and this also had an accelerant in it, so we wanted to ensure the safety of our men. Uh, due to odor spray, in addition, we provided false face shields with respirators built in uh, to protect their eyes and lungs to ensure that they can do a quality job and be safe. So for the soffit, uh, you can see a complete photo on the left here. Uh, with a wood screed finish that was used to ensure the pores in the shock rate were closed on the patch. The darker color of the shock rate is due to the silica fume content. Um, know that this is prior to placement of the white pigmented curing compound uh, prior to the moist curing for 24 hours. 
Uh, the vents were repaired in the same fashion as the deck, but had additional 40 millimeters of cover added. A steel trowel smooth finished was achieved similar to concrete troweled and formed faces. So you cannot tell if it was concrete or shock replaced. Smooth finishes allow for favorable water flow and it helps seal the surface from absorption of, of any other materials. As you can see from the existing conditions of, of these columns on the vents, the, the left is the existing condition prior to removals, that the areas with the most deterioration are where the drains were, which uh, were typically not functioning properly and draining from the deck above would have had chlorides in it, which would have accelerated this corrosion. The sequencing of vent uh, repair was completed with two faces at a time to ensure the column was still in service without adding any additional shoring to hold up uh, the bridge deck. The right photo shows the completed prep work done prior to placement of shockery. On these two photos, I'm showing the nozzle and moving around and working the area to ensure a 90 degree receiving surface to the proper encapsulation of the bar. And uh, as you can see in the background, the active TTC line, dust control and safety was a priority on this project. And we want to ensure that we provide a quality product. Um, the right photo shows a sponge finish that we, the city of Toronto, they requested a different finish versus steel trowel just to see the difference and if which method they wanted to choose. Um, they opted to go with the steel trowel method as they prefer the way it looked. I have additional photos here showing the vents uh, with removals and replacement of the shockrete. Um, note in the background, you can see additional vents we're working on and the white curing compound that's been applied after the 24 hour fog cure. I do have a uh, short little video here of showing the, the final pass of shock replaced prior to finishing with steel trowels. Our finishers cut the shockrete in place with rods to ensure the column finishes with intolerances for flatness and a steel trowel is used on the final pass. Bulkheads were used on the corners to ensure a proper chamfer was achieved to ensure if the columns get hit or anything wouldn't break off. Uh, so in summary, uh, we replaced uh, 70 cubic meters of shockrete, over 135 patch location, locations on the existing bridge elements, including piers, girders, and deck soffit while the hive was in service. Shockery was ideal on this project due to the strict schedule constraints and risks associated to the vibrating concrete structure caused by a live traffic overhead. We used an accelerated shockery to minimize the impact of vibrations and worked with King Shockery on this. Uh, the use of shockery eliminated the need for formwork for the city of Toronto and extended the service life of the uh, Gardner Expressway on this section. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention during this presentation and I'd like to open the floor for questions at this time. Thank you, Ryan. Let me ask you some questions here from the audience. Um, the first question is, how do you moist cure for 24 hours on a horizontal deck overhead? Great question. I'll see if I can flip back to... <clears throat> so on this picture in the right here, a uh, crew member using a fog misting machine, um, it has water and air on it, and we kept men for 24 hours, uh, keep going back and forth doing passes over all of the patches and shot areas um, to ensure that they were adequately moist cured. Uh, to put burlap or automated misters in, in this uh, project was looked at, however, due to the sequencing and moving around to multiple patches, it was not viable. So uh, we did the old way with manpower. Second question, Ryan, is um, is a maximum water cement ratio of 0 0.4 common for MTO shotcrete projects? I, I would say that's common. Uh, the mixes can be tailored based on the requirements and specifications of the project. Um, having Talking to the technical representatives of any material supplier is key to ensuring that uh, you get the right quality product uh, with pre bagged materials, especially uh, for the, these types of applications. Uh, it can vary essentially and it's project specific. 
I have a third question. How do you ensure the remaining soffit concrete is in good condition after surface uh, preparation has been completed? Sounding, traditional sounding was done by the engineer of record, marking it all out uh, and doing pre-inspection prior to shock replacement after the concrete was chipped, sandblasted and prepped ready for shock concrete placement. A final pass to ensure that there was no additional concrete removals required was done prior to placement of shock creep to ensure that we have a good bond to um, sound concrete. Perfect, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, I, if you could stick around to the end, if anyone else has any questions, we can uh, we can address them at the end of the presentations. All the presentations. Okay. The next presenter. Uh, today is um, the presentation is the power of real-time online concrete data. The presenter in, is Jordan uh, Karensvit, and he is the CEO of Exact Technology. So before Jordan starts, I'll just uh, give him a bit of a bio here so everybody understands who Jordan is. Jordan uh, Karensvit is the co-founder and CEO of Exact Technology Corporation, a Toronto company specialized in turnkey hardware and software solutions for the concrete industry. Prior to Exact, Jordan ran a number of technology business, businesses in the building automation and cellular communication industries. At Exact, he leads product development and works with a team of 15 engineers specializing in electrical, electronics, uh, mechatronics, embedded uh, systems, and software. Thanks, Jordan. So if you'd like to start your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and good morning, everyone. Great to be here, and hoping next time we do this together, it'll be followed by a delicious lobster dinner. Let me get my uh, screen shared over here. Just a second. How's that look? You got the presentation there? Yep, perfect. Okay, awesome. All right, so I'm going to be talking a little, about, a little bit about the power of real-time online concrete data. So I'm I'm picking up basically um, after Doug, we're 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 following concrete when it's placed and uh, for a period after that, and that's generally where our our concrete uh, technology kicks in. So a quick agenda, state of the industry, some concrete properties that are typically monitored when cast in place or even in precast. Uh, and then we're going to look at some different hardware and software that's used to gather this data. Construction processes have stayed the same for a long time, for the most part. If we think of how we communicate with one another, how we receive and share media, how we use maps to navigate the world, how we're paid or pay for things, we can see that digitization is transforming our lives in many ways. Yet, if we look at most construction sites, we see practices that the Romans would still recognize, ladders, scaffolds, and workers laying bricks by hand. Uh, I found out a few years back that construction was behind the times in terms of technology in many ways. And I realized that every concrete pour on this particular project showed here was going to be monitored. Uh, and the plan was to have a, a third party uh, drive around from site to site, spend a lot of money gathering all this data manually in the traditional way. And, and that really opened my eyes to the, to the value and the opportunity to bring real-time online data to concrete. And that's how I got into the concrete data business. And, and that's how Exact was formed a little over four years ago. So uh, back to uh, back to the last presentation here. Here's the gardener before they got involved. <laughs> and uh, one of the reasons we're, we're collecting data is so that this doesn't happen in, in a short period of time after uh, these kind of structures are built. And if you look around, a lot of our infrastructure is literally crumbling. Uh, we're building at an astronomical rate now. We have huge, huge projects going on. We're using new and improved materials and designing a lot of these projects for 100 years plus of service life. But for some reason, we're still okay building things the same way the Romans did. But if you're designing a building to last 50 plus years, why wouldn't you specify uh, that you want data to prove that the construction meets your criteria? So how do we know that a foundation wall or bridge abutment or repair patch has been cured properly? I can tell you that a lot of the ones I've seen under construction haven't been, 
So why not take more stringent requirements to ensure that we take advantage of this push for technology and build better buildings? And this is starting to change slowly, but surely. It's not about tying anyone's hands because the right implementation of the technology can enable constructors to change the way they build with added efficiency and speed. There have been many software advancements in the construction and the concrete industry, but that's only half of the picture. We need hardware to really understand how the materials are performing. You can now walk around the site with an iPad or even your phone and instantly upload a picture, send it as a deficiency to the subcontractor responsible for it. Many of the currently available construction management softwares link to concrete estimating for the general contractor. And there's other softwares that the ReadyMix supplier will use for batching, mix design, material tracking, ordering, uh, some of which uh, we looked at before. Uh, I think you'll see there's a whole other opportunity for concrete software. There are some major companies that have mastered but have not fully tied it to the internet of things. I think that's because there hasn't been a, a real upgrade to the hardware availability up until a few years ago, a few years ago in terms of just ease of use and reliability and cost of that hardware. So what are we able to monitor with concrete and connect to the internet to help us optimize processes and mix designs to better benefit the industry as a whole? Uh, well, a, a bunch of things, mass concrete temperatures, concrete strength and maturity in real time, relative humidity of the concrete or ambient conditions, even formwork, hydrostatic pressure, fresh properties in the field and in transit. These are the common parameters we've been seeing and need to monitor, though we've been having many discussions about taking it further as well. And why do we want to understand these parameters? Uh, some of these are obvious. We can reduce labor, uh, which in turn reduce, increases safety quite a bit. We can optimize mix designs, which can help with sustainability and saving money. And overall, we can increase the speed of construction activities and optimize the materials on site. Think about reducing formwork design or the amount of temporary heat that's required on a lot of jobs. We know we need to monitor large concrete elements. This isn't news to most of us. We see it repeated in all specifications. Why do we need to monitor the mass concrete? Well, first, there's the question that's continuously under debate, what is mass concrete? There's really no consensus on an exact size or dimension. Uh, even the codes and standards all have different definitions. We've got the US DOTs varying between three to eight feet of thickness, CSA saying one meter, but really as ACI states, there is no strict definition. Realistically, what we're trying to avoid based on the makeup of the concrete mix and the element sizes uh, are two things. The internal temperature of concrete element getting too hot and the surface of the concrete element from getting significantly cooler than the core of the element. And all this to avoid cracking or the potential uh, delayed atringite formation. And here's a, here's a good picture demonstrating that in a, in a piece of aggregate. So back to uh, one of the pictures I showed early on that, that got me into this space. This is, uh, this is another photo from the uh, Eglinton Cross-Linked LRT project. Every mass pour for the 26 stations at Edmonton LRT needs to be monitored to ensure the maximum temperature and temperature differentials are within the allowable limits. The plan originally was to have a third party spend a whole day wiring up the element with thermocouple cable, and then coming back twice a day for at least the first seven days to read data off a manual logger. And it's a very tedious process. I've, I've run a couple of cable myself. It's, it's not fun and it's prone to error. And it's a very reactive process. Uh, what happens if the differential is above 20 degrees by the time that someone gets to site and reports, it's too late to try and uh, avoid that situation. Uh, and three is it's extremely expensive to do it the old way uh, compared to some of the newer, more modern alternatives. So when I looked at what was happening uh, on Edmonton LRT and with my background in technology, I'm like, we can bring this online, we can do this better, we can, we can save the project money. So I wanted something that would bring data whenever we needed it, whenever the engineers needed access to it. Um, nothing really Bluetooth or, or Wi-Fi because there's a lot of reliability issues and range issues with those technologies, particularly on large construction sites. Uh, we wanted something that was really just gonna give kind of the ideal situation in terms of data gathering and in an ideal manner. So it meant real time, 
online data and uh, by, by eliminating a lot of the manual processes on this project in particular, uh, there were over $2.6 million in direct cost savings just due to the labor and the equipment that they were originally budgeted to use in the project. And those are only the costs that we could calculate. When the product was in uh, development, we brought it to site, we compared it to some other third party traditional equipment. It was our equipment was installed on Friday in the winter and the plan was to pour the concrete uh, the following Monday morning. So they had heaters set up for the weekend to keep the, the forms warm and uh, ready for the concrete. We were watching it online remotely from home and we realized uh, Saturday the temperatures dropped uh, abruptly. Uh, the heaters ran out of gas, we notified the superintendent. He, uh, he went to site, he got the heaters running again and by Monday morning the pour was on schedule, the forms were warm and things went well. So that's, those are just kind of additional savings that you can't even put a, put a price tag on, but uh, directly this saves the project money as well. Here's an example of a bridge in Ontario. It was monitored from mass concrete. It's a, it's a project from Metrolinx and they're following the OPSS specs. They have to monitor 18 different locations within this bridge to make sure they meet the requirements for maximum temperature and maximum temperature differentials. They were planning on running thermocouple wire connected to a bunch of different data loggers hanging on the side of the form. Probably would have taken a day just to run all that across this rebar. And what we did is we came with a little bit more modern technology, wireless loggers, and two to four probes per logger spread across the bridge, installed from the top, stapling quickly, literally took 30 minutes to wire up this bridge and get that data online in real time. Here's an example of a benefit of using this data uh, at all times. You can see where the arrow is, there's a drop in the temperature on the surface of the concrete, uh, a tarp blew off this particular site on the slab and they were alerted. And in this particular case, I think it was okay. They were in the kind of safe zone by the time this happened. So no further remediation was required. Um, however, if that happened a day earlier and I've seen that happen many days earlier, um, they wouldn't need to attend to it. If they didn't have that real time data, they could have shocked the concrete at a cold surface for a, for a long period of time before anyone bothered to notice. Mass concrete generates a significant amount of heat, as we all know, and you can see in this graph, uh, don't mind the fact that the maximum temperature is over seven degrees, 70 degrees Celsius, that's, that's another matter, but uh, concrete strength gain is accelerated with the addition of heat. Think of what is standard practice in precast production, which is adding heat to the forms in many cases to get that time saving. So why aren't we taking advantage of this extra heat that's being produced in these large cast and place elements? In the past, we would do pull tests, maybe, or throw the cylinders under the tarps, maybe. Um, this would be used in important situations like post tensioning or loading an element. But uh, by uh, using maturity, we can get that strength in real time and, and capture the heat uh, that concrete is generating. Uh, this is an example of another way of capturing that heat. Uh, now we're able to not just use maturity, but to actually replicate what's happening. We're monitoring the temperatures in the crane base with wireless loggers. And then you can see on the left here, we have a curing box that is also cloud connected and it downloads the temperatures from the site, anywhere that box happens to be on site in the lab across the city. And it matches the temperature in the box of those test cylinders to match the concrete on site. So for a crane base, We've done this a whole bunch of times across, across the country. There's many, many days of savings uh, in time just by capturing the heat that's in the, in the mass space and uh, applying it to the cylinders and getting those breaks accurately. Here's an example of um, some lab results um, showing this exact same concrete mix poured into some cylinder molds. Half of them were kept uh, in the lab environment around 22 degrees Celsius. That's the group on the right. The other half of the cylinders were kept in one of our curing boxes and it was matching the temperature of a mass slab poured, uh, poured on site. And after three days, uh, it's the same concrete, but uh, the ones that were matching the, the real true temperature of the concrete are, are hitting at 26.2 MPA. The cylinders just doing a typical lab cure, 9.4 MPA. So people get scared when they see the word maturity. So what is it? Maturity is a non-destructive approach to testing concrete that allows you to estimate the compressive strength of in-place concrete in real time. Adopting the maturity method on a project can eliminate the need for early age cylinder breaks if done correctly. 
ASTM 1074 indicates how to perform maturity testing and CSA 2019 now acknowledges maturity as a valid in-situ method for predicting concrete strength. As a result, mixed calibration is required to implement this concept on a project with the goal to determine a relationship between maturity and strength for specific mixes. It is actually a very simple process and we see a lot of projects starting to adopt this. Not only does collecting this data allow workers to move forward with form removal and post tensioning at more accurate times, but it also helps to optimize mix designs for reducing admixture or cement needed in some cases. For example, if you plan on heating the area, you most likely can reduce the amount of accelerating admixture. Although the use of brick tests has been common practice in the construction industry for decades, it does not mean that this is the most accurate and reliable in obtaining strength information. I don't know how many times I see this on site and then have the contractor scrambling because they have low break results and being told for the element. Knowing the strength in real time can make you build faster too. For example, this is 81 Bay or CIBC Square in downtown Toronto. They needed to know their concrete was at 16 MPA so they could jack the self-climbing formwork to the next level. And they wanted this in approximately 12 hours from placing the concrete to stay on schedule. And we were able to help them do this all the way up to the tower by using a carefully controlled application of maturity. It's not always sunshine or butterflies. We're starting to see some common trends in colder weather. Here's an example in this graph. You can see this is a high-rise suspended uh, concrete slab. They place the concrete, it generates some heat, but due to ambient conditions, uh, the concrete on site is actually curing below the temperature of, of the standard lab cure. So if they didn't use maturity here, their lab breaks would actually be giving them higher strength than they're uh, in reality uh, getting on site. So the point of maturity is to really to give you accurate breaks. Uh, hopefully, a lot of the time it's accelerating your schedule. In some cases, it might be slowing it down for, for safety. So that's okay too. It's good data. Another example of this is, uh, is fast track highway repair work. Uh, this method has been used for years on MTO 400 series and, and across North America. And with automated data, you're able to open the roads faster and more reliably just by getting this data in real time. And this is huge because in, in some cases, uh, you have a set number of hours you can close that road down for, maybe it's four or five hours. And if you don't open in that period of time, you could be stuck with fines of $1,000 a minute. So you want to get good data and you want to get it fast in real time. Formwork pressure is a really uh, interesting topic as well. When we're dealing with self consolidating concrete or pressure injecting. Uh, we're currently designing formwork based off of ACI 347 Guide for Formwork. If we're using SCC, we need to design them to withstand full hydrostatic pressure, basically as if we're pouring water into the forms. But if you've ever poured SCC, you know this isn't the case. It's not always super fluid. We design these mixes to have different viscosities based on the application. And in all cases, SCC has some degree of structural buildup, which means we are most likely over-designing our formwork and we are able to reduce the design of the former in certain cases if we understand the concrete properties and gather the data to validate it. This is a photo from the Edmonton LRT. They had some 70 foot tall piers and by carefully monitoring the hydrostatic pressure at different heights throughout the former on different pores, they were really able to understand how the concrete was performing, how much pressure was being applied and reduce the former uh, cost and structure by 40%. Talking about uh, reducing waste, there's a lot of way waste can be reduced. Here's an example, a little uh, email conversation. So at 10.19 p.m., uh, exact sent an alert that the temperature was getting high. Someone else found it a few hours later. Are you seeing this? He notified someone else, turn it off, uh, turn off the heat. This isn't a precast plant where they're applying heat to their products to, to cure it quickly. And sometimes you know, mechanics break down, a valve gets stuck, the heat keeps on getting applied. But uh, in this case, with the real-time data, they caught it at night before it got too late. And here's an example of the temperature graph. Uh, if they would have got over 160 degrees Fahrenheit, that girder would have been scrapped. It's a $50,000 US girder. But by getting those alerts, uh, they stopped the heat from generating. It plateaued, it went down, and they had a good, they had a good pour and they had a good product, and everyone was happy. 
Ambient monitoring is also very handy for repair purposes to monitor the external environment and prove it is adequate for curing materials. Also for buildings with fancy finishes, like this example, it's a courthouse and they have wood millwork coming in from Europe for all their courtrooms. Uh, and that millwork needs to be stored on the construction site at certain temperatures and RHs. So how do you, how do you ensure that? You, you get good loggers in there, you get the data in real time. If anything is close to getting out of spec, you take the appropriate action, you fix the humidifier or the heater or the air conditioning or whatever mechanical equipment you have there. Let's quickly take a look at what qualities we need in the hardware to have it survive on a construction site. One of the things we do at Exact is we build all of our hardware from the ground up. We're not repurposing. Jordan, sorry to interrupt, but you got two more minutes. Yeah, no worries. We're just at that. We're good. Um, so in terms of hardware, we build it for the construction world. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rough world out there. And uh, if you don't build the hardware to match, to match that environment, we've seen a lot of off-the-shelf products uh, that just fail and don't get you the data. If you're not getting the data, it's no point in doing it. So you want the accuracy. You want it to be plug and play. You want it to be durable. And of course, it's got to be economical as well. Software needs to be simple to use. It's got to give you the data in real time online, wherever you happen to be, on the computer, on the phone, at home, at the office. Auto-generating graphs and reports is also key. It saves you a lot of time once you're able to automate this data collection. And then of course, you want user-specific alerts. Different people need to know different things in different ways. It could be emails, text messages, push notifications, et cetera. This is just an example of a, of a dashboard. You could be getting from us or, or many others, just showing you a bunch of different uh, kilns or products that are curing in a, in a precast plant, or it could be a bunch of different elements curing on a construction site with strength, temperature, maximum, those types of things at a glance. Uh, and R&D is very important too. This is uh, some R&D that we had the chance. We were fortunate enough to work with Dr. Hooten and his team to supply some sensors to them just to figure out different properties of concrete and, and push the industry forward uh, using some real-time data. So uh, that's basically it. I appreciate uh, everyone listening and glad to answer any questions you might have. Perfect timing, Jordan. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so there is a question about uh, uh, getting a copy of this webinar uh, after the presentations. Um, just let you know they will be posting, uh, Stacia will be posting these webinars on the YouTube channel. So please look there for any for, for this uh, webinar. Uh, you do have three questions here, uh, Jordan. Um, with the push to lower CO2 concrete, will maturity testing allow for more use of SCMs on construction projects? Um, you know, that, that's probably beyond my, my technical expertise. I'm generally on the sensor and the product side of the products when it comes to the, uh, the concrete mixes as well. That's, that's where I pass it on to my business partner to, to figure I out. Can, I can quickly answer that. I think that the whole point is that we're show, you're able to really understand how the concrete is performing um, in the field so you really can get an idea of the strength gain and other properties um, so with uh, obviously the push for higher amounts of scms um, what we're finding is you're going to put more scm in the larger elements and we're able to capture that extra heat so even though we think that more scm means a, a delayed strength gain um, by capturing that extra heat it actually kind of nets out but obviously, I mean, there's there's pros and cons, and it's not always rainbows and butterflies. Sometimes in cold weather, we're showing that you actually don't have the strength that you think that you would have with a standard cured cylinder. Okay, the following question is, why is the concrete testing industry still using MinMax mercury uh, thermometers for job site cylinder storage monitoring? That's a, that's a great question. Not everyone is. Um, a lot of... A lot of uh, sites and a lot of contractors, a lot of labs are, are pushing for real-time monitoring just beyond the standard max mit. Uh, even like uh, Concrete Ontario has been pushing a project to, to push it further and gather that data in real time. So it, it's coming. Uh, the, the pioneers are definitely going beyond that and, and gathering in real time. One final question, Jordan. Uh, how is data transmitted to the cloud? Um, in different ways, uh, generally, you're going to be connecting into a cellular connection at some point, um, whether that be 3G, LTE, 5G, it, it doesn't really matter. That's just really affecting battery life. There's different and 
depends on coverage of, of where you are, but you're generally gonna have some sort of device that's connected to the cellular network to get everything online. And then on site, uh, in our particular case, we'll have some long range radios in our loggers. And those loggers will either be talking to a cellular relay or talking to the cellular tower directly to get you that data every 15 minutes or every five minutes, uh, depending on the site. Okay, I'm seeing some comments more than questions, I think, here. Um, in terms of uh, Concrete Ontario responded by saying, yes, we are pushing for sensors, time to evolve the industry. So that goes along with what you were saying, Jordan. Um, I think that's it for the questions. If there are any further uh, questions, uh, please hold on until the end of the next presenter, as that's our last presenter for today. Um, thank you, Jordan, very much for your presentation. Um, you. Our next presentation. Hey, Chris, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. Oh, okay. Sorry, there you go. Excuse me. Um, thank you, Jordan. Um, I will um, uh, start, we'll start off with the next presentation. It is our last presenter for today. Um, the, uh, the title of the presentation is Concrete Direct Enables the World to Build Safer, Smarter, and More Sustainably. Our presenter is Sean Ali. He is a general manager uh, and is in the digital RMX solutions. Uh, I'll start off with his bio uh, before he starts his presentation. Uh, so Sean Ali was born in uh, Toronto. He has an undergrad in engineering from McMaster uh, University uh, in 2005. Uh, he has spent 12 years with the Lafarge businesses locally in Toronto in typical business roles ranging from QC engineering to uh, general manager of multiple ready mix uh, concrete businesses. He has his MBA and PNG license. He, he obtained his MBA and PNG license during that period. Um, three years ago, he became the first team member of the Lafarge Wholesome Digital uh, in North America. He um, developed and scaled the Concrete Direct platform along with a growing team in Boston, uh, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, this team is now a key part of Lafarge Wholesome uh, uh, Mac Macker brand. And as I mentioned, his current role is as is the North American General Manager for Digital RMX Solutions. So without further ado, we'll uh, please, uh, Sean, uh, let's start your presentation. All right. All good, Chris? Can you see it? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, off we go. So uh, I know we're going to get tight for time here, so I will do my best. Um, thank you for the intro. Thank you for the opportunity here. Um, really good discussion to date. This presentation here is, as mentioned, a platform uh, named Concrete Direct um, under the Lafarge Wholesome Innovation brand of Maker. Um, and effectively, the lens that you will try to put on it here is from the ReadyMix producer side of things. There we are. Um, and as Chris mentioned, uh, time is the new strength is certainly the, the mantra that we follow with the mission being Concrete Direct enabling the world to build safer, smarter, and more sustainably by providing all stakeholders, direct and indirect, with relevant data granularity on any device, any location, and any time. And I'll go over a bit of an overview here, um, and then we'll get into maybe some slightly um, more detailed functionality discussions and, and then some adoption criteria and then attempt to end with a video, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so what you see here is, and as I mentioned, through the lens of a ReadyMix producer, the key stakeholders in a ReadyMix delivery are connected in real time. And those being, of course, the truck drivers, the dispatchers as we call them, but effectively the, the call center agents, if you will, of the ReadyMix producer. Um, and of course, those on site um, constructing something with concrete. And the basic functionality are quite simply, um, and not necessarily to demean the efforts of my team, but it's essentially, we've essentially brought to B2B what the B2C community had done for 15 years. So it's simple technology, we've built apps behind it and, uh, and essentially connected it with microservices to be open 
to to other aspects, other vendors um, to essentially be able to consume APIs as well. So what you see up top there is what we call the dispatch screen. Uh, bottom right is the driver tablet and left are the customer facing apps. And what we allow are order requests directly from mobile, we, mobile or web, I guess, but directly from the site, um, real time text communication between customers and dispatchers, of course, but also drivers um, replacing old sort of legacy at, at times, I guess, legacy CB radios with voice over IP technology um, and using uh, navigation services to provide real time tracking and ETAs. And of course, uh, beyond that, fully paperless offering, uh, as well as reporting and, and more than that, of course. Um, so what we what we followed is what we would call the traditional agile development approach, the, the genesis of which is in software development. And we follow it um, to a T as much as we possibly can. Um, and what that means is we release software every two to four weeks and we have a continuous feedback loop with our stakeholders. The, the, keys of the, the key stakeholder there being um, our customers, again, from a ready mix perspective, so those pouring concrete. And with that, that continuous feedback loop, we're then able to prioritize the next features to build in, again, that next two to four week uh, period that we term a sprint and release that to the masses very, very quickly. And what that allows us to do is um, release the, I guess the, the, the MVP product, but the minimum viable product that would provide um, value or essentially saleable value to a market without needing to spend, you know, many months or many years developing a product and then releasing it. And the, the maybe more importantly, this iterative approach and allows, iterative approach allows this continuous product um, enhancements to, to further improve based on that customer feedback. So as you look through it here, you can see that those key stakeholders obviously have different needs. Um, from a customer perspective, it's quite simply ordering concrete, understanding where concrete is, and removing a lot of those no value calls. And you'll see the results of that shortly with some a KPI screen that I'll show. Um, with dispatchers, it's, you know, they're quite comfortable in doing their role. But when you, when you approach them with this agile development approach and said, what would be a relatively simple but next key pain point for you? And for them, it was quite simply, I spend a lot of time going back and forth between tabs in my, in my browser to understand which plant is best to ship from based strictly on traffic. So you can see that it's quick and easy to embed. Um, in this case, it's Google traffic alerts. And I uh, can't see it quite too well, but even on the left there, a bit of a cost assessment to understand if you're shipping from a network of plants, what is the optimal plant to ship from to have concrete arrive on time and, and the most cost effective way, of course. And bottom right again here from a driver perspective, um, the goal truly is keeping it simple, right? The vast majority of drivers have been have long tenured employees. They perform the role many, many times, generally in the same metropolitan. Um, and really just need a digital tool to replace a lot of the paper, um, but also um, improve visibility of you know, truck behind them, easier communication among their, their colleagues. And as you can see here, a map that is not simply like most of us would use in passenger vehicles, that's not simply a, a, a passenger vehicle style map. So here we partner with a company um, named here um that allows us to put the specs of the truck into the mapping software to tell that driver exactly where they can go um you know low bridges uh load restrictions seasonal road restrictions things like that are removed from the options and then they are then sent on the most optimal route so i'll move on to to here to just show you quickly um, the value that's been extract, extracted by following these sort of simple rules through accessibility and transparency um, with data, of course, but removing essentially those no value added activities at a job site. So top left shows you 70,000 hours of saved customers. That's a 2020 figure just from Canada and the US actually. Um, and it's very simple, everything from uh, placing an order, the time it took to call in, wait on hold, um, modify an order now via text and in the end of the delivery, or I guess knowing where the delivery is, not following up on calls during delivery, 
but also then reconciling tickets after the fact is much, much easier to the tune of these tens of thousands of hours saved. And to the right, the linked uh, metric, the top metric was a 90% reduction of short calls and short calls are defined as those trivial calls, we call them the less than 30 seconds, the where's my truck calls essentially. And those re have been reduced drastically because of that transparency of you know, where a truck is in the, in the supply, I guess in, in the delivery process, um, and where the order is overall as well. Um, an interesting one on the bottom left there from an accuracy perspective, the fact that orders are placed um, digitally and um, the, the customers are aware of the, the details of the order when prior to this opportunity, it was essentially a phone call that is, um, of course, um, could potentially be um, could fall victim to, let's say, a, a fat fingering exercise from somebody entering it into a system or language barrier or misspeaking or a very loud job site, et cetera. Um, a top market after we dove into the data after a year um, was pretty interesting to see a 30% reduction in these canceled tickets that essentially meant the fact that um, even before a meter of concrete is batched and put into a truck, there is the ability to proactively review orders quite quite quickly. Um, and finally, I mentioned the paperless uh, ticket offering. Certainly COVID played a, a role in accelerating this adoption. Um, three quarters of a million digital tickets last year in place of paper in, in the North American market. And to speak to the adoption here, um, I, you see the, the countries that are focused on here in, on, the, on the right side, sorry. Um, 98 and 97% US and Canada respectively and 55% in Mexico that you see at the bottom there, that is essentially the deployment. So 98% of customers who do business in this case with Lafarge Folsom or Lafarge Canada, maybe in the, in the Canada example, um, could download an application and get a benefit from this immediately. Um, and that's the same logic down in Mexico, which is a little more than half now. Um, and under the, the heading of what gets measured gets done, um, you can see a graph there, assuming the colors are coming across the same for you, measuring, so in order to improve customer service, effectively we started measuring response times. And you can see the progress from um, early last year to the end of last year. The um, blue and orange lines are responses to messages and responses to orders versus the, the in-app order growth. And you can see, obviously, they, they diverge there at a pretty interesting point when the focus was let's respond to customers using digital means faster than we did on the phone. And you can see the organic growth essentially there. Um, other key metrics, 40% of orders now, actually it's greater than 50 now, but this is last year's metric, 40% of orders come through Concrete Direct. Um, the right there that I mentioned is 98, 97, 55 are those that could download the application. More than 70, closer to 75 now are actively doing that. So using this as part of their um, ready mix process. And from a messaging perspective, so 940,000 messages just last year in North America and now connected to 45,000 job sites and of course growing every day. So a little bit into the detail. So efficiency, of course, um, may be relatively simple to understand, but removing phone calls and communication among people and replacing it with pure transparency and digital tools to that phone that is likely in everyone's hands has allowed the ability um, to, to improve efficiency. So data is never removed, um, never deleted, it's there forever, and every relevant stakeholder has access to the, the portfolio of data that they require. Um, from a productivity perspective, this probably merges quite quickly with safety, but instead of paper tickets, QR codes have become the way of, uh, of receiving and, and applications, the way of sharing a ticket. Um, you can see here, so examples of every truck now comes with a QR code, so scan to receive what's necessary. In this case, this could very well be a site inspector who may need access to a single ticket, um, but from an application perspective, um, the customer app allows the ability to share a ticket or a group of tickets through any means that your phone could allow, meaning literally text, email, or I mean, you could tweet it if you really wanted to. And uh, more directly on the safety front, this one excites me a lot. Um, quite simply, the fact that the platform is connected to the relevant stakeholders 
we were very quickly able to create a site level risk assessment. And this was has been proven very valuable in our COVID times where many bosses aren't even on job sites, so they're managing remotely. Um, and we've, we've used, you can see five questions there. And these are the five questions that a ready mix driver focuses on that cause the biggest, um, essentially the, 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 the largest hazards that appear on job sites. And from a ready mix professional perspective, I can tell you that those job sites are where most of our injuries happen as well. So as soon as a driver arrives on a job site, essentially when the tablet breaks the geofence, the following pops up on the left. So it's a simple checklist, allows them to quickly review the job site. So things like, um, are, are you close to an unshored excavation? Um, allows them to indicate a hazard and that if a hazard is observed, that's communicated immediately with the internal team. So dispatchers, as I've termed them here, and the relevant customer customers connected on job sites. So they're able to see that my job has a problem that yes, could get someone hurt, but also um, is likely to impede the delivery and, and slow down the, the delivery. So I'll attempt this super quickly here. I know we're at the end. Chris, please figure this out me. We are here in Boston, Massachusetts on the campus of Boston University on one of the busiest streets in Massachusetts on a very rainy Saturday morning. And uh, it is a very large, more than 4,000 cubic yard core of the EcoPack mix. With process and product innovation, we are able to make this one of the most sustainable cores Farge Holson has ever done. We have connected all of our backend systems digitally directly with the customer. So at their fingertips are every ticket, every truck, every status of every truck to ensure that that concrete is delivered in 90 minutes or less. Concrete Direct allows every one of those stakeholders to have their own view of each individual truck to allow them to perform their tasks independently and safely on a job site like this. At Lafarge Orsin, our commitment to a sustainable future is stronger than ever. We are very proud to couple both product and process innovation at the Boston University Data Science Center. With EcoPath, this site has the lowest carbon product available as of today. And with Concrete Direct, the entire process was digitized without any paper whatsoever. All right, back to you, Chris. Thank you, Sean. I do see here you got a question. Do you need the Concrete Direct app in order to access a ticket, or can any QR code reader give you that data? Any QR code reader can give you the data. Perfect. Next question is, how is information such as the additional the addition of water on site uh, dealt with using this system? So just think quite simply of a digitized process. So drivers before, let's say, would indicate on a tablet water that was added. Somebody may or may not sign for it with, with the authority to do so. It's, it's the same means today. So a, a driver would indicate water added. Um, the, the enhancement here is that information is then apparent to every stakeholder right away. So water added to, let's say, whatever volume of concrete is linked to the ticket, and that ticket is also visible by everyone forever. One further question for you, Sean. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with balance loads in an electronic system? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. I guess it, it the same process that would exist before with quicker communication that a balance is required, I suppose. That's great. Um, I don't think there's any further questions for you, Sean. Uh, I'm gonna address some of the questions. Oh, wait, I think I see another one here. Is the, is the MTO on board with this? Um, so we, we have uh, worked with the MTO as well, with mostly with the paperless ticket opportunity. Um, and it took a presentation like this to, 
to work through it to allow them to understand that the data is maybe even more secure than someone writing it on a piece of paper. And uh, and yeah, so providing that. So the, the pathway there was actually connect a select number of job sites to Concrete Direct and also for a period of time, um, mail physical tickets at the end of the week and sort of slowly wean off of that process and become more digital. And of course, across Ontario, it's in, in varying capacities, but generally speaking, yes, um, with with the sort of maybe obvious challenges that may exist with the specifications. Perfect. So now we're in the question part of our, uh, of our present, uh, presentations today or webinar. Um, there are two questions that we've answered uh, in the question section there, but I will just um, uh, repeat them again here so that everybody can hear it. Uh, the first question was during the Shockcrete uh, presentation. Uh, the question is, are there any additives or measures for dust control other than uh, containment? And the answer that uh, Ryan had uh, at the time um, as he's locked off is that uh, he's not aware of any uh, that have been approved by the OPSS specifications. However, in the mining industry, they do exist with a maximum of, uh, if effectiveness of approximately 50% reduction. And um, the next question is uh, on um, during the exact presentation, um, what happens if uh, something for a telecommunication company like Rogers is shut down? Uh, how does the system work, I guess? Um, and the answer was that the uh, relays have two SIM cards to connect to either Rogers or Bell. Uh, some are built with satellite connections as well to avoid this. So if there isn't any further questions, on behalf of the uh, ACI Ontario and ICRI uh, Toronto chapter, I want to thank all the presenters today uh, for your presentations. And uh, we'd like to thank all the attendees as well for uh, joining us today. I'm not seeing any further questions, so thanks everyone.